Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you for joining me here today. Good morning, Juan. How are you? Thank you for joining me here on the live stream, the show version live stream, where today we're not going to go so much technical, talk about some of the things that we use to get to where we want to be in our careers, right? We're going to talk about certifications, talk about careers, my own career. I'll give you guys some uh, examples and maybe we'll talk about some resumes because I haven't touched my resume in about five years or so. Uh, so we can talk about that. But thank you for joining me here on a Saturday. Good morning to you guys or afternoon, evening, wherever you're coming from. Renee, glad to have you here. Really appreciate it. And uh, I moved it to a Saturday morning because Man, those weekdays sure have been getting busy. So I hope you guys have your coffee or whatever drink you have on you or in your hand at the moment. Let me know where you are coming from and what you are currently drinking. I take a sip of my coffee. Woke up pretty early this morning. Um, this week has been quite the, the ride for me. It's been busy. There was a lot of work to be done at the workplace, at my, at my employer, where bringing over uh, fiber to the home. So on my campus, we have non-student residential areas, so staff and faculty. And because they're working from home, we need to provide them with top-notch internet, right? So they, they need to have pretty good internet. and. It, it was a project that was already in the works. It was uh, just escalated, so the timeline shifted and, and I had to move quickly. So even though I work with wireless and networking, you never know where you, where you end up or what you end up working with. I ended up going and learning about GPON technology, right? So we have to do fiber and had to do deal with residential gateways, um, so wireless in the home, all the other homes dealing with each other's wireless. So that's what I had to deal with this week and was quite busy. So uh, Juan, coming from Ch uh, Chile. Ch all right. Uh, Juan Valdez Coffee. All right. Oh, well, that sounds pretty good. I bet you it's better than the cup of coffee I have now. And Francois, thank you for joining me over on Periscope. So I am trying something out different with this live stream where I am going live on YouTube, but I sent the stream out to two other locations. I sent it out to Periscope and I also sent it out to my Twitch account. So my Twitch account, I don't even use that much. So this is the first video that will be going live on Twitch. Uh, and uh, Juicy, you're drinking some Ethiopian coffee. Oh, I've had some Ethiopian coffee and that is really good. Alan Wang, thanks for joining. You're having Phil's. Tesora, that is an excellent coffee. I have Phil's uh, in my cabinet right now. Um, I was thinking about brewing some some Phil's coffee, but it's so early that I would have woken up my whole family trying to grind those beans. So I'm thinking about putting uh, like an espresso machine down here or something in, in, in this garage so that way I don't wake anyone up in my family. Thank you guys for joining me. Uh, I'm really happy that you guys are here. We're going to talk about certifications, right? It's kind of a interesting topic and... Uh, it's, it's one of those things where you go for certifications uh, for a variety of reasons, right? And a lot of us have those certifications. We, we have done these certifications because we felt that we needed it to get somewhere in our career, get to the next level. Or maybe you're trying to get your first IT job and that's one of the first things you did is went and got a certification, whether that be uh, a CompTIA certification like Network Plus, or you took a CCNA, Cisco CCNA certification, try to improve your standing as a candidate to, to show that you've got some skills or knowledge to do the job. So uh, over time, my, my uh, view on certifications has always shifted because you know, it really depends on on uh, the the job outlook, what what's currently out there, and then you run into people who do have certifications and they're either really really good at what they do, 
or they are horrible, right? And so there are ways to utilize how to utilize these certifications in your job and improve your prospects, right? So you, the first thing to certifications, I believe, is you got to think about your why. Why do you want to go for a certification and what will it do to improve your current situation? So if you're currently out of the job, like many people currently, now might be a good time to pick up a certification. And whether that is to uh, improve your skills and make yourself look good in, in terms of uh, applying with other candidates, because there's going to be a lot of other people that you would be in the hopper with. And so you need to differentiate yourself. And so certifications are one way to do that, right? If you're applying for a network engineer position, you kind of have to look at that job description and see even whether or not they they care to have a certification. A lot of times there are companies that just don't don't care if you have a certification because it means nothing to them. They they either depend more so on your experience and your thought process of how you're going to be when you're on the job. <clears throat> the other thing they look at and and I would say the really good companies primarily look at the person and how you are as a person and not necessarily how many certifications you have. And so to get started, I always tell people, go after the certifications that you are most interested in. I, I don't recommend getting, <coughs> getting um, as many certifications as you can because uh, what will end up happening is when you advertise to the world that you've got a whole list of certifications and a wide range, say uh, networking certifications, systems administration, like Microsoft certifications. Um, it's it's uh, it'll it'll I think lower your chances as far as being someone they select uh, to bring forward. And the reason why is if you're going for a more specialized role, if you're applying for that specialized role, you should be specialized in that role, right? You, they don't want kind of the um, master of none and and go with that person. They'll pick the, the right person that's got the experience. And so if you want to get into the networking field, you should focus on getting network certifications. And, and nowadays, even that's changing because networking now touches so many parts of the, the infrastructure, including the cloud, that some people, some companies kind of want an engineer that will know how to do routing and switching and wireless and also be, be able to route things out to the AWS cloud, for example. But I say get focused and start there because uh, what I've done in the past is when you've got, when, when I've had a lot of certifications, I've actually removed some from my resume. So if I was applying for a network engineer position and I had some Microsoft certifications, and let's say the job description didn't say anything about Microsoft, I would actually remove those certifications from my resume just because I didn't want them um, to see that. Like, I just wanted them to see that I was focused on network engineering. And uh, if, if you guys have any input too as well, put it into the into the chat. We'll, we'll, we'll bring it up. Francois, my co-host over at Clear Descent, is, is watching on Periscope with the whole family. Uh, hello, family. Thank you for joining me. So the other reason why you would want to go for a certification, because we want to know if it's worth it, right? Uh, a lot of times you'll, you'll find people who are either for certifications or are, they are against certifications. I am for certifications. And if it will sharpen your skills then by all means, go for it. Go and study for those certifications. Sometimes I look at those study guides, those books, and I will go through those books, but I don't necessarily take the certification because I'm looking to get some, some knowledge, some skills that will help me in my current position. And sometimes that's the easiest way to, to go for some structured content, some structured material that will give you that information. And so if you're if I'm dealing with routing, maybe I've got some uh, TCP IP books, for example, like I have back here on the shelf. And so use those certifications to sharpen your skills, but um, don't be afraid to 
to go for them just because somebody says certifications are not worth it. Uh, and, and maybe uh, when someone has developed their career and they're at the most senior level, maybe certifications are not worth it to them. So it's, all, it's always from a personal perspective. And so when it comes to, to taking these certifications, some tips, Ismail wants some, some tips for the new CCNA 200-301, which I, I currently have the, the books here. I went and grabbed it just to see what's in there, right? And, and I took the CCNA, I think, to, I, I renewed my CCNA about two years ago at Cisco Live. I went and just took the exam. And when you have networking experience, the CCNA will seem pretty, pretty basic unless there's something you don't uh, touch upon so often, like IPv6. I don't work with that a lot. And so I was worried that I would be thrown a lot of IPv6 questions. And so if you look at that certification, the CCNA uh, certification, the new one, what I recommend doing is getting yourself a lab because I find that any kind of lab experience is going to be uh, the most beneficial because you get to actually see how the hardware works or how the iOS, um, uh, the network operating system, how it works, and you get a good feel for it. And by, the, by more more labbing you do, you're going to end up memorizing some of these operations. And so that's what's, what's important. And I know uh, there are also a lot of good training videos out there. Uh, CBT Nuggets has a good training course uh, by like really good trainers, Keith Barker and Jeremy as well. And so some of the things you have to know for CCNA is obviously some basic routing. And in routing, you're going to need to know about EIRGRP, which I find to be the easiest of, of the routing protocols. So you want to be able to get a lab that that allows you to work on these routing protocols. Then you, you, you have to learn about OSPF, for example. So both IPv4 and IPv6, that's something you want to look at. And then on the switching side, you're going to need to know about VLAN, spanning tree protocol, creating uh, bonded interfaces, lag interfaces, or ether channel. And then you got to learn some of these other technologies, which which I find difficult for a lot of people that don't have the experience. So the WAN technologies like uh, PPP, GRE. So this is where things, uh, tools like Packet Tracer come in handy, GNS3 or EVNG or even the new uh, CMLP, the Cisco Modeling Labs. Um, you'll want to invest some money into resources that will help you because you're investing in yourself with these certifications. So that's where I find the most value. So personally, I like to take uh, computer-based training uh, at my own pace and then combine that with labs. Uh, so some of the certifications that, <clears throat> that I recommend going for, the top five certifications for network engineers, the first one's going to be the Cisco CCNA, obviously, because it's an, uh, I find it to be the entry-level uh, certification from Cisco which was just recently updated a few months ago. It's often required on a lot of job, job listings. It's probably one of the most, um, the most listed certification. If you even did some research on, uh, when you're looking through uh, job listings, you'll see CCNA listed on there. But it is also focused heavily on Cisco solution. So if, if you are going to go for a networking position and you have a CCNA, but the job ask for uh, Juniper experience, then uh, CCNA might help, but you need to look at the resources from Juniper, for example. They've got uh, free guides on transitioning from iOS command line syntax to Junos. So, so things like that that you could use in your arsenal for, for interviewing at a job. So the first one, CCNA, definitely a good one. This one I got just off of Amazon. Uh, I barely opened it but I wanted to see uh, what came with these guides because I will be posting some videos that are CCNA related, but they've got some, some simulator light labs part of this. So a lot of things like configuring the switch or router, the like basic things like usernames and, and, and interfaces, host names. They've got uh, things like configuring uh, switch forwarding and security. And then in volume two of this, that you go into access control lists uh, and extended ACL. So 
pretty useful stuff as far as I'm concerned when it comes to on the job because I do work with a lot of those um, different features that they teach you here, the different topics that they discuss in CCNA. So definitely worth going through the book, learning the theory, and then applying that theory to a lab. That's going to be the most important. The second certification I, I actually recommend going for is the CCNP 350-401 uh, Encore Enterprise Routing and Switching. So this is one that I'm actually most interested in looking at next because this will actually go into much more detail above the CCNA, uh, more so like on the routing side, and it's uh, focused on enterprise networks. And uh, this is going to give you, I think... Um, how I've always viewed Cisco certifications is you'll get a lot more detail going into a CCNP level certification and probably more related to what you see in the, in the real world. The CCNA, I think will give you that foundations and, and be able to configure switches and routers at the basic level and have a basic understanding of routing but CCNP and CCIE will actually get you to the real world because there's a lot of material there that, um, like routing, for example, not every environment has basic routing setup. You go into these large environments and they've got some complicated routing, virtual um, routers, all these different things like VRFs and having to deal with troubleshooting. I think troubleshooting is going to be the best one. So that's why I like to tell people the, try to get a lab environment going, even if it's one you could rent from like Cisco, for example, on their training. Because if you could break that lab and try to figure out why it's broken, that's more closer to the real world environment. The other certification I recommend going for is the uh, Juniper, Juniper GN CIS Enterprise. Uh, it's also listed uh, often on a lot of job descriptions. It's the next level above the Juniper Associate certification but the uh it's it's very similar to the ccnp level and i feel a sneeze coming on all right it's gone don't you hate it when the sneeze just kind of leaves your mind the command line syntax for juniper is very different from cisco ios but uh the routing and switching fundamentals still remain like you're still going to use those fundamentals you just got to use them in a different syntax and, and so I got this book here because I didn't see any official Juniper training. Instead, I got this Juniper uh, book, Junos, Enter on enterprise routing, which uh, the, the topics it goes into is configuring uh, Juniper enterprise routers like the M series and MX series, ju uh, configuring Juniper interfaces and advanced troubleshooting. Talks about routing protocols like uh, BGP, for example, that's going to be a big one. And then some layer two uh, services, multicast, things like that. And so for me personally, it's more about understanding Junos as an operating system, because uh, having had Cisco experience, I understand the routing and switching side, it's more how do you configure this on the Juniper side? Uh, the next certification I recommend going for then is the CWMP CWNA certification, the Certified Wireless Network uh, Administrator certification, because wireless is the primary way people connect to the network. I think it's critical to understand how wireless works and how to configure it properly. I know it seems easy. You just put up an AP and then you're good, right? But in an enterprise level, you might be dealing with a uh, you know, couple of APs, hundreds of APs, or even thousands of APs. And so understanding how uh, wireless frames work, how, the, how those transactions go through between AP and client, and what happens when you have a higher density or even a high capacity network where you've got devices and, and, and really intense applications over wireless networks, you want to be able to design for those environments properly and also be able to uh, design them to the capacity. And so I have... A uh, couple of certifications up there. There's a couple couple of books that I recommend. There's some uh, official certification training books from CWMP. And then you, there's also one from Cybex written by uh, David Coleman and David Westcott. Those are two excellent books to get started. But with Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 6E, 
coming around the corner, I think it's going to be important to understand wireless. So the last certification I recommend getting is either the Cisco DevNet Associate or the Juniper JNCIA DevOps certification. Network automation may not be part of your, your role right now, but it's increasing, becoming increasingly important to understand it because as these larger networks are starting to use network automation, some of that will trickle down to the smaller networks. And so it's quite possible that we might not see a command line interface in the future. We might just be dealing with uh, web GUIs to deploy routers and switches, even on small networks. But as a developer or an, um, I don't know what you want to call it, like a DevOps or a net DevOps, you still have to understand fundamental routing and switching. You have to understand how all that works in order to, I, f I feel, to automate the network. It, I, I think you'll have a greater advantage if you've got that strong network background to really understand how net network automation works. And that way you don't make uh, large scale uh, errors because you could, uh, I, I find that automation, you will make errors much larger, bigger errors, faster, since you're trying to automate a lot of network devices. And so uh, the materials, Juicy, that I've used for DevNet and how I um, study for that, I actually just went to developer.cisco.com. I looked at the objectives for that certification. And on developer.cisco.com, they have a lot of free labs. So I use a lot of those labs to understand those objectives. And then there's a lot of other resources I've used online just to understand um, uh, some uh, programming concepts in general, just doing some Google searches on like continuous uh, implementation and development. I did a lot of research there online. And so that's, that's what I recommend for the top five certifications. And if you want to see some of those, I actually do list them on my blog if you just head over to roeldionicio.com and uh, in the blog I have top five certifications for network engineers and so with certifications it's important to know how not to use your certification so the first thing is um, and juicy to answer your question do I plan on going for DevNet Pro uh, or uh, the next level not yet. Uh, I'm not even close to being a, a, a proficient DevNet associate level um, person where I'm autom fully automating networks, so I'm not quite there yet. So going back to how not to use your certification, and if you guys have questions before I move on, let me know in the chat, or any other tips that you might want to share, let me know in the chat. If you guys found some of those tips useful, hit the like button. I would uh, appreciate it. So going over to um, how not to use your certification, I would not rely on your certification 100% to get a job. Certifications are there to enhance who you are as uh, uh, a candidate. So I've been in uh, different interviews where employers ask if I have a certification and then we'll start drilling you on questions related to that certification just to see if you've understood the material and, and still retained it after you passed the exam. I've been in uh, interviews where the employer did not give a rat's ass about certifications. They, they, they ask very detailed questions on like troubleshooting. Maybe they'll bring up a very specific scenario that they've been through and then ask you, how would you solve this problem? Or they give you a scenario and say, here, solve this issue for me. What happens next? And then some of them will go through the theory and ask you, uh, you know, what happens when device A tries to talk to device B, but you've got a router in the middle. Uh, and then they'll ask you, like, what changes in the packet, for example. And so it, it's not a certification is not a guaranteed way to get a job or even increase your pay. I've done that before. I, I, I was in a position where... I went and got my CCNA and then, you know, what would be the next expected thing? Let me go ask my employer for an increase in pay. But there really is no difference in the position you have where 
the moment, the day before when you didn't have a certification and the day after when you do have the certification. There really is no difference that the employer sees with you as a, a worker. And also a lot more um, is involved with pay when it comes to certifications, right? The certifications, uh, a lot of the surveys you will see where people have a certain certification and then their salary is like way up here. A lot of that depends also on their their experience. I would say the the only place where that probably doesn't relate are like software developers. I, I notice that software developers, um, especially in the Bay Area, can can make over six figures straight out of college, right? But I think people have this unrealistic expectation that because you have a certification, you will get a certain pay. Uh, that salary also depends on where you live. I know a lot more companies are being open to now paying um, what they would pay someone in a certain job role, even if they lived in a city where the cost of living is not very high. So there's some companies in the Bay Area, for example, because Bay Area has a high cost of living. And so salaries here are often higher than, than other cities. So for example, in San Diego, where I used to live there for a, a very long time, even as a an IT manager, I once I had an IT manager role. I was making under ninety k. The moment I moved to the Bay Area, I was already over a hundred k, and that's because it's the Bay Area. But some companies, when they hire people remotely, and you're living in, I don't know, Wyoming, for example, some companies will pay you the same salary as they would pay someone in the Bay Area, and some companies will not. And so that's just something you have to look at when you are applying for some of these positions. So just remember that the certification is not a guaranteed way to get a job that you're going for or get a specific salary because a lot more goes into salary as well. And also no one likes to work with a uh, someone who has a CCNA but can't configure basic things like an interface or do some basic um, connectivity, troubleshooting basic connectivity issues. I ran into uh, very specific uh, scenarios where I knew this person had a CCNA and they actually like to talk about how they have a CCNA. So I would give them some tasks like, all right, configure the switch. Here's the IP address I want you to put on this switch for management. And they couldn't do uh, IP address configuration on a switch, which is covered on in the CCNA level. And when, when it was connected to the network, it, they couldn't get to it. So they couldn't troubleshoot and tell me why, why it wasn't working. And so when you are starting lower on the totem pole as someone who just got a CCNA and is just using this knowledge, the one tip I have for you is when you cannot figure out why it isn't working, try to figure out uh, or try to remember like what you've done to, to figure out what the problem is before you go to somebody higher up and say, hey, it's not working. I would approach them with, hey, uh, I couldn't get this uh, switch online. Here, are, here's what I've done to try to make it work, but this is this is what I've tried, and it, it, I, I don't know what else to do. And so, you want to at least approach it in a way where you've told them exactly what you've done to try to fix the problem, so that way you're not just going to them as kind of like this last ditch effort. Hey, help me fix this. Um, it helps to at least let them know how you tried to fix the issue. And so, with the certification. Um, how not to use it is, uh, it, it's hard nowadays to use a certification to stand out from others because there's so many other people who have say a CCNA certification. So you have to stand out in different ways. And so you can stand out in different ways by, um, fixing up your resume because that is going to be kind of that first look of how, uh, uh, an employer will see you. And I'll talk about a resume in a bit. But you want to use certifications to demonstrate your knowledge and methodology when it comes to troubleshooting or understanding a topic. So you want to be able to explain those um, uh, efficiently to an employer when they start asking, asking those questions. And so one of the things I do want to share, uh, CBT Nuggets, and I'll use them again. CBT Nuggets has this site here, if I can scroll up. It's uh, cbtnuggets.com, state of IT certs, and you could download some research that they've done. And so I'm looking at California, for example. If I click on California, 
it's going to tell me what they see as the top three certs in California and the number of jobs that list that certification in the job description. So you can see here CISSP in California is very much uh, in demand and then CCNA and then uh, MCSC way down below. So it's not to say that these are the only three certs. It's just what it, when they're looking through job listings, this, these are the certifications that they've looked at. And um, it, it'll say here there, there's been over 2.2 million IT jobs in California in the last year. Now, that might change given this period with COVID-19, but all of this is relative to the workforce size. California has a high ratio of technology jobs. We, we have uh, the Bay Area, Los Angeles, and San Diego very heavy with, with IT jobs and especially working with the government. And so looking at this, you could go to whatever state you're in, and it could be that the state you're in might not have a lot of IT jobs. So if you're looking for a job locally, That'll be pretty difficult if if there's not that many there. So you might want to look for a position that that will hire remotely. And so if we look at uh, I don't know Wyoming for example, you can see how different this is. They they've only had about three thousand eight hundred sixty one IT jobs in the last year, and CCNA is their top top certification. And so here you can download the free report. You'll have to put in uh, your information as it shows down here. And then uh, you, you can see that report. And so let me try to pull it up because I did download it for you guys just to show you California. And so here's the information technology report. Uh, specifically, I put my zip code, so it, it showed me San Jose. And so here are, are the uh, IT jobs posted within five miles. I live very close to a lot of the big companies like Cisco, uh, Juniper, Microsoft, like Google. All those companies are pretty nearby. And overall, the job, it gives you kind of overall what the job market looks like. So the best certifications in my zip code, it gives you about um, like CCNA is like way up there. And then there's others. So I don't, I don't know what those others are. It could be uh, developer related certifications or something else. But, but CCNA is like way up there, right? So uh, this is what I mean. You have to stand out differently because you're going to have to deal with everyone else who's got a CCNA certification. And so that is the more difficult part. That is how you become you. You got to um, you know, spruce up your resume, maybe build up some blog content. So if they look up your name, they can see that you are actively talking about the topic that you're an expert in or you're trying to be an expert in. And, and going back to the report, we can see which companies are hiring. So Supermicro uh, has a ton of job postings. I'm not sure. What's up about that? Like, that's a lot of job postings. I actually just bought a super micro server for lab purposes, which I can talk in a about in a different day. Uh, I don't know these other companies. I do know who Synaptics is. They're, they're nearby. And so what level of jobs? So there's a lot of entry level jobs. And I, I don't know how CBT Nuggets defines these as entry level. It could be that the career listing page actually lists this job as an entry level job. But look at the number of senior level positions. So if you're coming uh, fresh into IT, uh, I, I don't recommend going trying to go for mid-career or senior. You can try, but um, having been in a position where I wasn't knowledgeable in that level, it is an uphill battle, right? You're going to have to catch up really quickly if you happen to land yourself in that role, which which happens, right? If you, if you know people or if you nailed that interview and they hired you um, and it took uh, you know a stab at, at hiring you, then kudos, you got that you got that role, but now you got to catch up and understand if you're fresh, what what goes on in that role. And so the report's pretty short. That's about it. So I just look at this as where. Where is my area standing with the job, um, the, the career that I want to be in? So I just wanted to share what I saw from CBT Nuggets. I thought it was a pretty useful, uh, a pretty useful thing. And then the other thing I want to share with you guys is I recently surveyed about ten pros, and so I asked them what what you'd wish you'd known before becoming a network engineer. I highly recommend looking at that because there's a lot of great insight from 
from seasoned professionals here. Like I, I look up to Daniel Dibb quite a lot. He's very knowledgeable and has, shares a lot of great information. And so he focuses on things like learning fundamentals, which I mentioned before, and then uh, contributing to the community, which which I tend to do try to do as much as I can and helping others. And you will run into imposter syndrome, for example, but just read through this and hopefully it'll give you some, some inspiration to keep moving forward in what you need to do. So a lot of these people are, have been in, in it or networking for a very long time, especially like Chuck Keith, for example, he does a lot of great training videos, provides a lot of great insight into what you need to know moving forward. So he's talking a lot about network automation, uh, some, some Python programming, things like that. Uh, David's got a really good tip, which my favorite is this one right here. <laughs> and I don't know if you guys have worked with anyone in your uh, field who fits this, but no one likes working with a person like that. And so part of being in this career is being someone who is, is easy to work with, who is knowledgeable, who is open to sharing information. We don't like silos like that. And so uh, definitely read into these tips. It's really good. Uh, I highly recommend it. All right. For those of you who are still with me, I'll kind of dive into uh, the story of how I got started and how I got to where I am now. All right. So where I am now is I'm in, I'm in the Bay Area. Uh, I work for a university, but I also have my own business, my own side business, which has been pretty... Um, pretty lucrative for me. I, 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 I've been lucky to have, <clears throat> have clients that are willing to pay me, but I've built up to this point. Right. Uh, and Mantis, you want to share, you want me to share the link? Um, yeah, I can share the link. Uh, I'll keep it up here on the, on the screen. So you can see the link up here in the top. Um, you can actually just go to my site, roeldionisio.com, hit the blog and you'll see the post there. So uh, I'll leave it up here for a bit just so you guys can share it because I can't really add anything to the chat at the moment. But just head over to my main site, to the blog. All right. So, to, so, so how I got started, uh, I think my IT career started in San Diego. So I got my first helped us job back when I was like 19. Um, and I was making under 30,000 a year doing help desk. I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but uh, I, I, I wanted to explore different uh, verticals, right? So I was either into network engineering or systems administration or systems engineering. Uh, the network engineering part was a lot harder for me to get to. So I started uh, going down the path of of starting with help desk, which I recommend a lot of people to at least take a help desk position, if, especially if you're just getting started because you understand how the users are, are using resources on the network, right? That allows you, having that knowledge allows you to troubleshoot uh, a lot more efficiently and proficiently because if you understand what the user's trying to do, then you could probably get down to the root cause a lot faster because sometimes it's more of a user issue than a network issue. Everything gets thrown up to the network like, hey, so-and-so can't do this. It's a network issue. And you got to prove why it's not a network issue or, or, or fix it knowing that it is a network issue. So I started uh, at 19, about uh, under 30K a year, US dollars, doing help desk. And then uh, a year later, I end up going to a different company as a PC support specialist. I ended up joining a, a friend of mine. And so we worked together in this one company. It was fun. You know, when you're young, you have fun at these companies. You're not really thinking about your, your career. And then I graduated uh, at ITT Tech, uh, which is no longer around. I graduated around 21. And so I was already in the IT field, uh, but not necessarily in a job or position that I wanted, but I knew I needed to get experience to get to those roles. And so I was working at a company where I had access to people who were in those roles. And so I looked up to them. I tried to learn from them as much as I can. So I'd ask a lot of questions. And, and one thing that I recommend is asking questions. 
If you don't understand how something works or how something was solved, go ahead and ask that question. Hopefully the other person is open to telling you why or how they fixed it. If they are not, they're just, uh, those are the type of people I do not like to work with, the ones who do not share. Because uh, over the years, as you um, get into a role, sometimes you find that whatever help you can get, you will take it, right? So if I can teach somebody how to do something and they can help me out because of the uh, the job duties and responsibilities that I have is, is uh, you know, the task that you got to do, you, you got to get a lot done, then you can hand some of that that stuff off. And so as I learned a lot, I ended up at 21 getting a systems administrator job. And so at the time, that was just $37,000 a year. And so you can imagine uh, how much these guys get paid now, but I was still entry level. So I learned how to do things like Microsoft server administration, uh, building a lot of physical servers. I still had to do troubleshooting uh, whenever, you know, tier one help desk couldn't do it and they got kicked up to me. Uh, started doing a little bit of Linux, but because Linux was difficult to learn, I kind of shied away from it. So now I'm actually using Linux a lot more. But then uh, as... As I got more skills, I was still at the same company. I tried to ask for an increase. So I was I asked for an increase to go to 50K, $50,000 a year. And during that time, I had acquired a CCNA. I had a couple other certifications like an A+, plus, a Network+. Plus, and I was starting to do a little bit more networking, but more like on the Dell networking side of things. And then later, uh, at the tail end of that systems administrator job, I ended up touching Cisco equipment firewalls and um, I remember back at the time the 65 uh, Cisco 6505 or 6513 is what it was like pretty solid Cisco switches and so at this role and, and I was there for like five years and just know like if you're at one one job for five years that's that's just doing the same job for five years you're not really a lot of times you don't really gain a lot of experience over the course of five years working at a, s a small company where things don't change that much. And so I was told 50000 was too high. And this is where I started to learn how to negotiate salaries because you can either go and approach your, your manager and say you want a salary or a salary increase, or you could do one better and say, here's why I should have a salary increase. You basically got to give them a reason not to say no. And so you got to list out all of the achievements that you've done at that company, why you're valuable there. So the key thing is you got to, sh you got to bring, show them what your value is because negotiating is going to be very critical. You can't just go, I mean, you, you can get lucky. You can go and say, Hey, I want to increase and they'll give it to you as long as it's in the budget. You got to remember that, uh, these companies do budgets for the year. And so if they didn't budget for giving increases or budget for, um, you know, a range of salary for a certain position, you're not going to get it unless you, um, they can find that money somewhere. And a lot of that has to do with having great managers as well and, and people who manage the finance for that, for that uh, department. And so I was told my increase was too high. And so like anyone who gets told no and you, know, you get depressed and you're like, I don't, I don't know what to do now, right? So I started looking for another position. And so I, I wanted to get myself out of that position. And this is where I made the mistake of going for the money, right? So I, I, looked, at, I, I looked for other jobs and saw that I could get a higher salary somewhere else. And so when I did that, I actually moved from a sysadmin job to a senior IT support specialist role at the age of 26 and I hated that position. <laughs> I was in an organization where I thought I'd be building something. Um, but given the title that they gave me, senior IT support specialist, I was more just troubleshooting things where people weren't using technology the right way, right? They were using like these, um, static databases that, um, beyond what they were capable of, of using when they should have been using real databases and, but I was able to increase my salary quite a bit. So even though you've got a higher salary, 
if you go solely for the money, you will find yourself in a worse position. I did not like my job. I didn't like going there and I needed to find a way out, right? Um, and, and when that happens, that's when you start looking for another job. So I was only there for three months, right? Three months at this position and I already started looking for another job. I even lied to one of the higher ups. He asked me how, how I liked the job. I was like, yeah, uh, I like working here. It's great. I lied to his face. And then I had to address it when I had to put my resignation letter. And he, and he even brought it up. He said, you said, you, you told me you were, you were happy here, but you're not. What's, you know, and sometimes it's just good to just be upfront um, with, uh, with with your position right because if you're not happy maybe there was there wasn't this uh there wasn't an expectation met in the role and so you got to address that with with these guys because sometimes the titles can be misleading right I've, I've learned that some companies have titles to meet certain salary expectations you could be going in for a network administrator role but they could be having you do network engineering tasks for example which are very different, right? You got an administrator and then you got an engineer. But they might try to put you into a network administrator role to keep your salary lower. And so there's different strategies that companies do. And that's why you got to read the job description very carefully. If you do interview for that position, you got to ask them a lot of detailed questions about what the role is, what they expect out of this role, what kind of tasks are they going to be doing uh, within the first three months, the first year, that kind of thing. So after my three three month stint at this senior IT support specialist role, I was 26 years old. I found myself working for a managed service provider as an IT manager, and um, I remember when they first. Uh, so I had a recruiter reach out to me asking if I wanted to apply for this role, and initially I declined them because I said I don't even have management experience, and they ended up contacting me again saying, "All right, here's how." how they view IT managers. And so at an MSP level, it was a little bit different. And I maybe had like one or two people that I actually managed. So not quite a lot of people, but I actually enjoyed this role quite a lot. It, even though I was an IT manager, I had the, the position of making certain decisions for a network, but I was still doing everything, right? So I had to do networking, I had to do census administration, I had to do help desk. So I did it all. But in this role, I learned a lot from my managers. And so this is where I started to learn at the age of 26 how management and the people that you report to is very key. It's not always about the money to chase, even though these guys paid me around 80000 in San Diego. Uh, I really like this job. I learned a lot from this job. I learned a lot from, from my managers and how to handle people, how to handle certain situations. I was also comfortable with going to them with any concerns that I had, and they addressed those concerns very quickly. And so I found that these guys were were uh, really a, a pivotal point in my career as far as picking up a lot of different things. And so I, I was there for about, I don't know, three years. Uh, I, I hopped around a different, uh, they had different clients, so I was going around to different clients and learned about different environments and how those environments dealt with their networks. And so having the experience, I would say that's one thing with going with like a VAR or any um, MSP is you get to see different environments and that gives you different experiences, right? Because a lot of different uh, environments do things differently. Uh, but then as I went through that, I ended up getting a network engineer position because so at the IT manager role, I actually started to pivot myself as a network um, person. I expressed more interest in doing networking. We didn't have anyone who was a specialist role at networking, even though uh, some people uh, had some experience, but they just weren't that versed in it. So I took it upon myself to, to put myself out there and say, hey, um, if you need network uh, expertise at these other environments, can I be the one to learn and do, and this is where I learned how to do wireless, I learned how to do uh, configure uh, routers and switches for certain environments, do the redundancy, all that kind of thing. Uh, and that's what really 
got me into the role now where I'm a network engineer in the Bay Area. And at the same time, I ended up starting my own company, which is focused more on the wireless side. So I have a side business, uh, a consulting company that focuses on wireless design, configuration, troubleshooting. And at the age of 32, I'm 34 now, I was able to land some large contracts with, with different companies. And I was able to land uh, at the age of 32, a contract that was $120,000. Now that wasn't what I got to take home, but that's how large that, that contract was. And I had to learn things like project management, dealing with other um, uh, subcontractors that I had to hire while juggling the full-time job. Uh, now, would I recommend people do this? No, but I am trying to get to a specific goal and going back to how I use these certifications is I've, I've got this knowledge that I've learned through the certifications and applied it to whatever my current role is. And so now at the eight, uh, a year after that, at the age of 33, I was making 100000 extra in income as an independent consultant uh, working with different companies. Currently, <laughs> this year, 2020, is when I started to really learn how to code. So started um, picking up Python and using my lab environments and whatever resources I can get. And having the extra income allows me to actually purchase some equipment in order to do these labs. I'm, I'm able to uh, try to uh, do things to certain routers and switches and being able to, to leverage uh, like Cisco's DevNet labs, for example. And so now I'm learning how to code. I'm learning how to run a company a little bit more efficiently. Uh, it's more of a company of one, but I still, and now even in this time, being able to get some requests for quotes. And so now my projects are transitioning from really small projects to a little bit more larger projects. And so I, I'm now at this crossroad where I have to be careful with how much work I do on the side because I still have this full-time job. And will I transition over to working for myself full time. Maybe that's a possibility, but I just want to share like where, where I was and how I got to where I am now. Cause I, I never expected myself in about 10, 15 years that I would be uh, starting my own company. I just never, I never thought that was going to happen. Uh, and some people would be scared, you know, they would, they wouldn't ever do this, but there there are some risks that I'm willing to take to get to that to that next level for me. And and I know most people won't be like that. You can you can just see like how I've gone from help desk to systems administrator to IT manager back to engineer. So I've used all of that different experience to to leverage how I am today, even as a network engineer when I work with other people. I'm able to understand how, all right, you got a user here who can't do something specific. How can I troubleshoot that? And if they say it's a network issue, do you take that uh, as their word or you take it at face value? Like, how would you troubleshoot that? But knowing that I've got uh, the experience from help desk, I'm able to ask questions at a help desk level. Like, hey, did you do this already? Like, what's the deal with this? Or is it just this one person or is it everybody that's having the issue? maybe it's not a network issue, right? So that's that's how I've taken that previous experience. And whenever I see people try to go from not being having any IT experience to just jumping straight into network engineering, I kind of tell them to slow down a bit and actually get some experience first in IT. So that way you can use that experience to get to the network engineer role. Now, a lot of people will make it straight to network engineer, but I just feel that they they, they haven't picked up a lot of experience that that they could be better in their role as a network engineer. And so for me, my role now is um, helping to build this IT community, be uh, someone who can share information with others because when I was in my position years ago, I did not know who to go to. Uh, it, I learned in the, in the wireless field, in the wireless industry, we've got people we could look up to. And I just want to be able to help others. Uh, I know like Daniel Dibb, for example, is really about the community. And so I'm just following his footsteps and trying to contribute back and help others. And so what I've done is if, 
I can share my resume with people. So some resume tips that I have. Um, resumes are pretty interesting because now a lot of this stuff is automated. And what I mean by automated is companies just look for keywords, right? They're not really sitting there looking at everyone's resumes because they get hundreds of these. And so what do you do to try to stand out? This is a resume I've, I've been using for the, I don't know, for how long, ever since uh, 2012. I've been using this resume. And what I've done over time, it's evolved where uh, I've, I have this line up here just to kind of give them an idea of like who I am as a person. They'll probably just take that as a, with a grain of salt. <laughs> but I list a lot of keywords on here because what's going to happen is these companies are searching for key. If here's an example, if they're looking for a candidate that has CCNA, if you don't have CCNA listed in here, they're probably not going to pick your resume. Um, or if you didn't put it in the application, they have a CCNA, they're probably not going to look at your like look at you at all. Uh, I do know that in this resume, I don't even have my certifications listed. At one point I did, which you could just, you know, at the bottom here, go certifications and then list them out. And don't list out every single certification you have. List out the ones that are relevant to the, to the position that you're applying for. And so what I've done here is um, just highlighted some technical stuff that I've worked with. I know a lot of companies tend to ask, have you worked with this type of equipment or this protocol? And so I list that because it just kind of stands out in, in uh, the search that they're doing for when they're looking through the resumes. One of the things I've done in the past is actually remove stuff. And so now what I would do if I was applying just for network uh, engineering roles, I would actually remove a lot of these things like Exchange, Server, Active Directory. Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't want that. Uh, group Policy, I, I'm going to remove that. Microsoft SharePoint, Microsoft Server, I would remove all of these. There was at one point where I had on my resume and in LinkedIn, um, I can't even remember it. It was like a um, very specific uh, server from Microsoft that the, the it, it was like automated deployments of something. And I would get constant queries on that because it was such a specialized role that it was turning into that I just removed it out of my resume completely because I knew I did not want to get uh, positioned into that role. And so I removed it. And here, what I recommend doing in a resume, let me go down to one. I haven't updated this in a long time. I only updated it to remove company names. Uh, I recommend in your resume, you highlight results. Highlight the things that you've done that actually made a difference in the company. And so one of the things, for example, as an IT manager that I listed here in this company was I, I, I bold things in the beginning that, that are relevant, I feel, to whatever I'm, I'm uh, applying to. So I, for example, here, saved over $19,000 a year for this company. So even if they didn't read the whole line, they can, see, they can see in bold that I've done that, right? I've done cutovers before. Um, to a whole new circuit, creating new NAT rules, that kind of thing. Did upgrades, maintained a call manager, for example. Uh, did, um, remember when you did uh, P2V projects? <laughs> when we converted uh, physical servers to virtual servers? So, and, and I think I learned this, this concept from a security expert. I think his name was Lenny... Zeltzer, I think that's who I got it from. But this method has helped me actually get to uh, at least a phone call with like HR and then and then conversations with uh, hiring managers. So when you are applying, you're going to have to get through HR first. All right. So my wife uh, is an HR professional. She's given me tips on how to get to at least to HR and then through HR to the hiring manager because what they're going to do is the HR people have the job description and they're going to put this to the job description and say, can, does this person meet this role? And then they will, um, you know, aggregate all the ones that make sense and send them to the hiring manager. 
So a lot of times the hiring manager is not the one looking at the resumes on the first go. And so I actually made my resume public. If you want to see it, you would just go to uh, roeldionisio.com slash resume. Let me just type it in there so you guys see it. So here at the top, roeldionisio.com slash resume. Hit enter there. And that just brings you to this Google Doc page. If you want to try to use this as a template, go ahead and do so. Um, Hopefully that works. And, and education, I don't even list like who I got my degree from. In IT, a lot of times degrees don't even don't even matter. I work with people who didn't even graduate college and they're way smarter than me when it comes to, to network engineering. That's what I have for you guys today. We're at the one hour mark. Talked about certifications. Are they worth it? Yes, they are. I believe it's it's how you use the certification in the end and how you use it to get to what your your goal is. Talked about my own career path, the journey that I that I took to get to where I am today. And hopefully um, you have you have something that uh, you can gather from that. And then I shared my resume if you're still looking for the job as we get out of this COVID-19, maybe you want to um, update your resume, you can use mine as an example. And you got a question from uh, Yobi Najar uh, do you have advice for, for starting my first IT job? I have a bachelor's degree in IT operations and information security, and I have my CCNA. So with that information, you've got a lot of knowledge that you've, you've gotten. Try to get an entry level job. Uh, I know a lot of people don't like this when they hear it, but try to at least start with help desk. Help desk is, is your, at least a way to get some, some experience behind you being in IT. Uh, with an IT degree and your CCNA, you, you should be able to at least get some interviews in help desk. And you, they may ask you, so they may ask you why you want to apply for help desk if you got your CCNA, because they may be worried that you won't be there for long. You'll, you'll jump ship, you know. Um, you can tell them up front, I'm looking to just get experience. I want to, uh, you want to be able to understand how IT works. You want to be able to uh, you know, work closer with technology. You want to show them that you're eager to just do the job, right? And that you're, you don't want to tell, give them indication that you're going to uh, leave them for the next role. Because it's not what it's about anyways. Companies have to get used to people leaving in general. But I would say start off with help desk for your first IT job or work at um, a VAR and work underneath somebody else. And when you do get that job, at that first job, try to figure out who the network guys are and become friends with them. And by becoming friends, I mean help them out, right? Understand uh, what they're doing by asking questions. Uh, ask them how you could help them. Is there any task that they want to have offloaded? If it, tell, tell them that they could teach you how to do it. And they can shadow you to do it the first couple of times, and then maybe you can start doing it for them so they can focus on maybe the more complex projects. So that's an example. You could, yes, you could remove CCNA from your resume because a lot of times, uh, and I've had this where, where uh, a, an employer will say, well, you've got this on your resume. I'm concerned you're going to leave. Like, that is a legitimate question I've been asked. They say, you've got this on your resume. I'm concerned you're going to leave me in a year or three years. And you have to be prepared to answer that question, right? So you could remove CCNA altogether in your resume, or you could rephrase your answer and say, well, maybe I won't leave you. Maybe I'll move up in the company and still be here in this company with my CCNA. So it's entirely up to you. You got to test it out. So remove it from your resume, apply for jobs, see how that works. Add CCNA back into your resume, apply for jobs and see how that works. And so you... Uh, I would track like how many resumes I would send out or how many applications I would do. And I, I just wouldn't be blasting it out everywhere. I would wait uh, for a few and then adjust my, either my application, my email I would send out to, to people and see what resonates with, with hiring managers and HR people. So I would, I would definitely do that. How long, uh, Mantas asks, how long max would you stay in help desk position? Uh, as long as it takes for you to understand 
how how help desk works, right? Because you could be help desk where you're supporting network people. If you've got a good relationship with a network team in the tier two, you could work with them in figuring out how how these problems arise. Like I work with with help desk people a lot in my current role. So they'll send they'll send tickets up to me and then they'll start asking me questions. And I'm more than happy to tell them like, all right, here's how I troubleshoot this scenario. Here's the type of questions I would ask the user. And so you could start to glean uh, insight from a tier two level person, a network guy. So you can then use that to be very good at what you do in help desk. So um, it's a very hard question to answer because I held a help desk role for a long time. I want to say, geez, let me look at my resume. Um, since 2005 to 2007, I was in help desk. Uh, and then I would just leverage my relationships I had with, with networking guys. Uh, Yobi asked, do you have any tips for DevNet Associate? I have gone through the DevNet Fundamentals course, but still don't feel like I'm ready for the exam. Start doing more labs. Go to developer.cisco.com. Maybe I'll, I'll do that with you. Let me pull it up real quick. Go to developer.cisco.com. There are labs that you could look for. Sign up for an account. It's free. Um, they've changed it up. So look at these DevNet certifications. I know there's a, a course that they were using. But look at these objectives. And what you want to do is try to align some of these objectives with the lab. So you see how, see these objectives right here? Objective 1.0. They've got the topics, and then they've got the, some study materials here. If you click on these, go through every single lab you can go through that's associated with this. You'll find other labs that you'll find useful as well. <clears throat> this is what I primarily use to study for DevNet Associate. I have no background in programming. I have no background in using Git and Python. I and I learned. I started learning the, really going through this in October 2019, and then I took the exam in February when it was available. So I went through all of these and I started blogging about them as well. So if you go to my site, I have a, a DevNet Associate section where I I'm starting to go through each of these and. Re, re teaching myself some of these concepts so it, st it sticks in my mind and so i have some videos where where i go through this where i've started talking about uh, uh comparing data formats and parsing uh xml json yaml to python, python data structures you got to actually do that and some of these labs are publicly uh, like the the cisco routers and switches some of these are always on meaning you don't have to go through Cisco's site to use that lab. If you can hit that router directly through the URL and the username and password they give you, you can set up your own labs to try to understand uh, XML, JSON, YAML, try to understand using these APIs. So again, you can you can go through some of the videos I have. I have a DevNet Associate playlist. You can uh, look at that to get started. I'll keep adding more to it. Um, so Almighty Mech says he spent about a year in end user help desk support. Yeah, I mean, uh, when you're doing it day in and day out, you'll end up becoming an expert in help desk. You'll start, uh, w once you get an expert at answering every single one of these questions that come through the help desk, uh, then maybe it is time to start looking for the next role, whether that's in the same company or in a new company. Uh, one thing I would also recommend working on is your soft skills at the help desk role because a lot of that is interfacing with end users so the more happier you can make end users in the end of the call uh, that makes you a better a better person even a better engineer as you work up different roles in your career so there you go that's that's all i have today it's 9 10 over here getting ready for the the weekend i got um my wife and kids' birthday coming up soon, so I gotta start planning that out, but really happy you guys were able to join me here today. If you guys have any questions, let me know in the comments, head over to the YouTube channel, or feel free to hit me up on Twitter. 
at Roald Inicio. So these are the two different ways you could reach me online. So I hope you guys found this live stream useful. I'm going to try to do these show version live streams regularly. At the beginning, I tried doing them seven days. I did it for seven days, every day for seven days. And that was actually quite challenging. Uh, it was challenging for myself, but I want to thank you guys for joining me here. I hope you guys found something useful. If there's topics you want me to, 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 to discuss in a future episode, let me know in the comments and I will try to do that. But again, thank you for joining me here today and I hope you guys have a great weekend. Montes. Thanks, Lariana, for joining again. Thanks, Mick. Have a good one.